Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. So glad you're here today. Please continue to enjoy your lunch. And one quick note to the board, if you all can stay after, we'll take a board picture. Okay, I'm Rebecca Letts, the board chair of the Council for Life board, and we are so glad to have you join us uh, today for the 2023 Life Lessons Box Lunch. We have the nationally acclaimed Scott Klusendorf to join us and speak to us today, and we're so grateful. Many of you have been friends with uh, CFL for years, but a lot of you are visiting a CFL event for the first time today. So I'm gonna give you a little background and a few details. Uh, Council for Life exists to empower women, men, and youth to make life-affirming choices. Council for Life is motivated by Christ-like love and responsive compassion. CFL is committed to raising public awareness of the complex issues surrounding unplanned pregnancies and providing financial support to agencies that share our mission. This is important to remember. CFL does two things. We educate the community with events uh, like this throughout the year and we fundraise uh, to support pregnancy centers, maternity homes, adoption and foster care agencies, post-abortion support and healing ministries, parenting and life skills education, youth and college mentoring, targeted media outreach groups that provide the love and support that women, babies, and dads need to get on their feet and support their families. I read a lot of, of things out uh, to you about what we support, but it, it's really the full, the full thing from, from educating youth all the way uh, to parenting. So there, there are a lot, of, um, a lot of wonderful agencies that do important work that we support, and we're so grateful for that opportunity. So I want to give you a quick overview of the materials at your table. The first item is the CFL mission and core values. On the back is the list of uh, our 2022 outstanding grant beneficiaries. We're so grateful for the work they do to help vulnerable, frightened women choose life for their babies. Then the next item is a list of pro-life resources that includes the CFL website and the CFL YouTube channel, which contains 75 of our CFL speakers from the past 10 years. We also uh, provide a list of helpful books, social media accounts, movies, and even some pro-life songs performed by past CFL luncheon speakers. Also on your table is what we call the CFL infographic. This sheet summarizes the amazing number of local and statewide resources available to women, babies, and families. We often say the answer to an unplanned pregnancy is not abortion. The answer is love. This information sheet tells a great love story about our state. On the back side, it also tells the horrific tragedy of abortion in our nation and state over the past 50 years. The final item is your Council for Life advocate brochure that has more information about the work of Council for Life. Please hold on to the brochure because after Scott talks, our Director of Communication and Philanthropy will speak more about the brochure and some exciting news. Now it's my privilege to introduce to you our CFL 2023 Life Lessons Box Lunch Chair, Stacy Burke. Stacy's a member here at PCPC, and she and her wonderful husband, Tyler, have been longtime supporters of CFL. And this is her first uh, board role with Council for Life, and we are so grateful that she is serving on our board this year. Thank you. Thank you all. I feel like a rookie. Um, so glad we're here. Y'all are all here to join us today. And first, we have to say a huge thank you to PCPC for hosting us in their beautiful new uh, fellowship hall. Our beautiful fellowship. I attend here as well. Um, and a huge CFL 
thank you to the one that you're enjoying, the Festive Kitchen, who's a longtime, um, incredibly generous supporter of Council for Life. So um, we are enjoying Festive Kitchen and Snyder Plaza, who um, provided all of the box lunches today. So thank you to Festive Kitchen very much. Now it is my honor to introduce Pastor Paul Goebel, Associate Pastor here at Park City's Presbyterian Church, to give us our prayer as we begin um, the rest of the event today. Thank you, Paul. Would you please pray with me? Our Father in heaven, we come to you this afternoon as our creator, the one who has made all things who sustains all things and holds all things together. And we praise you this afternoon that as you have created all things, you have made human beings in your image. And so we pray, Father, that you would grant us a greater vision of what it means to be image bearers. And in our time and in our place and in this city, as your people, to pray for, to guard and to fight for your image as it has been endowed in your created people. We pray for Council for Life and for their mission. We pray for the countless avenues and ways in which they seek to protect life. We pray, Father, for pregnancy resource centers, for adoption agencies, and Lord, for the many men and women who even now this day are considering what to do with an unplanned pregnancy. We pray, Lord, that you would go before all of those who serve with these men and women, that you would give them great wisdom and words to say and hearts that do indeed have love and compassion. And we pray that through your power, Lord, that you would enable fear to become hope and that life would be valued. We also pray, Lord, for those who do choose life. We pray for organizations that come alongside young moms and dads and support them to come around them and help them to now be the moms and dads that you have called them to be. And finally, Father, we pray for us, even now, this gathered group, that you would give us a greater vision of what it means to be involved in this kind of work, to find our place in your story that you are writing, in a way that we can be a part of a community that values life, not simply because we should or ought to or it is the right thing, but because you are our creator. And you have called us to be your image bearers. And so we pray, Lord, that you would redeem broken things and that you would also build life into us and through us as your people. Be with Scott now as he speaks and be with us as we listen. We pray that we would leave this place with a greater understanding of who you are and the people you've called us to be. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Paul. That was an incredibly beautiful prayer. We appreciate you, and we appreciate Park City's Presbyterian Church. Um, it's my privilege to get to introduce Scott Klusendorf to you. Uh, about 10 years ago, his book, The Case for Life, added logic and science and analytical thinking to my sorrow and compassion that was in my heart about preborn babies the ones who are basically, sadly, unmentioned when the national debate about abortion is happening. Ann Carruth, our founder of Council for Life, knew the persuasive power of Scott's thinking and speaking and writing. And back in 2013, in October, she had him come and speak to our Dallas community at the Trout Lecture. Some of you may have been there. Um, but we today knew it was time to bring Scott back 
to help us speak with passion and clarity and conviction to protect the precious little ones that are in the womb and to talk about their mothers and fathers and protect all of them from the tragedy of abortion. A lot has happened, a lot has changed in the last decade, and especially in the past year. In our post-Roe world, we know we need to hear the apologetics, the lessons on how to speak about life. For over three decades, Scott has taken audiences through the complex and controversial topic of abortion rights and has dissected the lies from the truth, the facts and the logic. Uh, he's cut away the false arguments. He's brought reason to the debate. You will be equipped and empowered today to leave here and compassionately and communicate with your family and friends the beautiful truth about pre-born children. Scott's book, The Case for Life, will be out in just a few months in a completely revised new edition, and I hope you all will pick up a copy. He is the president of the Life Training Institute. He is nationally recognized as the expert on pro-life apologetics. He speaks and trains students, churches, political leaders, uh, lay leaders. He debates the foremost abortion attorneys and advocates. And then he teaches at universities around the country, some of the top names that you would recognize, MIT, UCLA, the Air Force Academy, University of North Carolina, and so many others. He holds an undergraduate degree from UCLA and a master's from Biola in apologetics, uh, Biola University out in California. Scott just returned from England. He went on a daddy-daughter trip with his little Emily right before she's going to be married this summer. <laughs> so he knows the importance of great parenting on the life issue. So please join me in welcoming Scott Klusendorf. Thank you. I can't, we won't need that one. Thank you so much. What a joy to be here today. Um, we have a tradition in our home. When you graduate high school, dad does not buy you a car. <laughs> but dad will buy you experiences. And so the way we do this is, when you graduate, if you want to go visit someplace, you point on the globe where you want to go, and dad tries to cash in enough frequent flyer miles to make it happen for you. <laughs> well, <clears throat> when my oldest son, Jeff, graduated high school, I didn't even need to think about where we were going. I knew where we were going. We were going to go to the beaches of Normandy, France, to the landings at D-Day. And he said, Dad, I want to go to Omaha Beach, and I want to be there, where that first wave of Army Rangers hit the beach. And those of you that know the story of the first Army Rangers know that it was no easy task what they faced. They landed and sustained 80% casualties, and here's why. Those of you that saw the movie Saving Private Ryan know exactly what I'm talking about. The first 40 minutes of that movie depicts the challenges in front of our guys. They were dropped into water that was 25 feet deep. They, they were told they were going to get dropped into water that was shoulder depth. And the guys are carrying 100-pound weaponry and packs. They go straight to the bottom and drown many of them before they even get a shot off. Those that don't drown only survive by ditching their packs, but now they have a challenge. They've got to run across a beach with no weapons while they're taking fire from the front and from the sides. And you can imagine the carnage that ensued. And as Jeff and I were standing there among all those white crosses depicting the casualties of that day, Jeff said to me, Dad, let's go down to the tide, let's go into the water, wade out into it, and walk back toward the beach the way our guys would have that day. We're standing out there having this unbelievable father-son moment, and the French tour guide is yelling at us in French, come on, come on, you're holding up the whole group. I'm like, hey, babe, we saved your butts in this war. We're staying right here <laughs> enjoying this father-son moment. Thank you very much. <clears throat> but men and women, as I stood there in that tide water, knee deep, it struck me what a, a, a total feeling of helplessness it must have felt like to not have what you need to engage. And 
For many of you here today, you might be thinking, you know, since the Dobbs decision, since Roe v. Wade was overturned, by the way, that is very good news. Don't let anybody talk you out of that. <laughs> Absolutely. But as you know, since Dobbs, we have lost every single time a vote has been put to the public on the abortion issue. Even in deep red states, Montana couldn't even bring itself to protect babies who survive abortion procedures. In Kentucky, a red state, we lost on the abortion issue. And in other states where we thought we had a chance at getting rid of constitutional, state constitutional protections for abortion, in a state like Kansas, that went down. We lost huge in Michigan. And uh, I wanna tell you why we lost, because there tends to be some confusion on this. A lot of people think, well, we just didn't have a good enough marketing campaign. That in part may be true in some places. But you know why we lost and why we continue to face challenge and why many of you may feel like you're in way over your heads and that you're outgunned and you're not sure what you should do? Part of the reason is, though it's very good news Roe v. Wade has been overturned, the worldview assumptions that make abortion plausible to millions of our fellow citizens are deeply entrenched in this culture. And men and women, they're not going away overnight. We have a fight on our hands. And you know what that means? All of us in this room now are pro-life apologists. All of us need to know how to make a case for what we believe. In fact, we're so committed to this that before you leave here today, you're going to know how to defend your pro-life view in a minute or less, and we're locking the doors. You're not leaving until you <laughs> prove to us you can do it. Council for Life has assured me they have got their thugs out there and you're, you're not leaving until you can prove that you can cite that one minute defense. We are kidding, of course, but it is very serious that we know how to defend what we believe and today we're going to help you do that. And I have some good news for you. A lot of you might think, well, wait a minute, do I have to have a PhD to give a good defense of the pro-life view? No, you don't. You don't need a PhD, you don't even need a college degree, you don't even need a high school degree. You know what you need to do? You know what your job is, men and women? My friend Greg Kolkel puts it real well. Your job is not to close the deal, it's to put a pebble in that person's shoe. You ever had a pebble in your shoe when you're out hiking? It wears on you and wears on you until you have to stop and deal with it, right? Well. That's what we're gonna help you do today. And you don't have to memorize every objection to the pro-life view, but you do need to be clear on three questions that we're going to help you be clear on that will help you communicate persuasively the pro-life argument. And um, this is important because a lot of times in our culture today, people think that anything that is pro-life is simply blind faith religion. And part of the problem is our culture thinks faith is completely divorced from anything rational. Now, I had faith that the plane was going to get me here this morning. I was on a reputable airline. Delta stands for don't expect luggage to arrive, but you will. <laughs> I'm not kidding. My luggage didn't arrive today. That's why I have no books to sell. So, uh, but I had faith. There's two guys up in the cockpit with thousands of hours of flying experience. I'm on a reputable airline. I'm on a mode of transportation with a proven safety record. But note that my faith was not a blind leap in the dark. It was not belief in spite of evidence. It was trust based on evidence. You know what the problem is? Our culture today thinks that anything that they define as religious has no basis in reasonable thought. I don't know why I got bored a few months ago and I decided to turn on that bastion of conservative theological thought known as The View, and there <laughs> I was watching Whoopi Goldberg talk about abortion. I just happened to tune into this, and here was the astounding theology that Whoopi dropped on us that day. She said, that when it comes to abortion, it is nothing more than your own religious view that's in play. And you should not be imposing your religious view on anybody any more than she would impose her view on you. She had reduced abortion to an issue of personal preference like choosing chocolate ice cream over vanilla. And we wonder why so many people today don't understand abortion. They have reduced it to mere likes and dislikes. They don't understand the moral issue that's in play here. We have got to be able to clarify this issue. So here are three questions that will help you do that. And if you memorize these three, get a handle on these three, you can make a difference where God has placed you. 
you can put those pebbles in their shoe. The first question we need to be clear on is, what is the unborn? In fact, we're going to spend a lot of time on that one because it's the crux of this whole thing. The second question we need to be clear on is, what makes humans valuable? What is it that gives us our dignity and value? Is it something we are positionally as image bearers, or is it something we do through performance by being self-aware enough or being cognitively present enough? What is it that gives us our ultimate value? And finally, we need to be clear on the question of what our duty is. And the good news is, if you have a handle on these three questions, God will use you where he's placed you to put that pebble in the person's shoe you're talking to. So let's get started. We'll jump right in. Let's start with that first question. What is the unborn? Now, I want you to do a little thought experiment with me. I want you to imagine you are washing dishes one night after, after supper. You're scrubbing away. And as you're scrubbing the plates, your little five-year-old son or grandson comes in behind you and says, Daddy or Mommy, can I kill this? Some of you are looking at me like, oh, those cute little boys would never ask such a question. May I enlighten you? I want you to note this piece of metal on my finger. It says that I've been married to the most glorious woman in all of Christendom for 38 years. We have a son, 32. We have a son, 30. We have a son, 26. We have a daughter, 22. I have personally heard the question, Daddy, can I kill this? More times than you can imagine, usually with his hands wrapped around his brother's throat as he's asking. <laughs> Note that I am not teaching parenting advice today. When you hear that little pipsqueak say, Daddy or Mommy, can I kill this? What's the first question you will ask? What is it? What has he got? Cockroach, snail, fire ant, do whatever you want. Do not show your mom. Do not show your sister. <laughs> Neighbor kitty, whoa. Brother by the throat, call Pastor Goebbels, right? You're not going to hesitate. Get help. You would never in a billion years say, sure, son, have at it, till you answered that predicate question, what has he got? You know what we just did? We just solved the abortion issue. Can we kill the unborn? You know what your answer should be? Yes. If. If what? If the unborn are not human. But you got to answer that question, not merely assume an answer. And our culture simply assumes the unborn aren't human. It doesn't argue for it. It simply assumes it. Let me ask you this. Would anybody argue for choice, privacy, or trusting women if we were talking about killing five-year-olds? No. Why do they do that with the unborn? Because they assume the unborn aren't human. They don't argue for it. They just assume it. I'm not going to be political today, so I won't name names, but when the current president of the United States, who goes by the initials Joe Biden, <laughs> spoke on the anniversary of Roe versus Wade, he said something that illustrates exactly what I'm talking about here. Here's what he said. He said, reproductive health care, by which he means abortion, that's his code word for it, reproductive health care. He said, reproductive health care is, quote, good for everyone. Mr. President, with all due respect to your office, does, quote, everyone, unquote, include the unborn? Is it good for them? Notice he simply assumed the unborn weren't human. He presented no argument for it. And people do this all the time. Imagine if I knocked on your door as an IRS agent and I said, when did you start cheating on your taxes? And you protest, I don't cheat. That's not what I asked you. When did you start? Well, you would be visibly angry at me, and rightfully so. I was assuming the very thing I was trying to prove. I made no argument that you cheated. I just assumed it. And this is what people around you do. They'll all the time make arguments in favor of abortion that would make no sense at all unless they assume the unborn aren't human. Would anybody argue for killing an innocent human being because they're expensive? Never. The homeless might be expensive. Is that a justification to kill them? No. Why do they argue that way with the unborn? Well, what about that poor woman that's already got 10 kids? Yeah, I agree. She's got a hardship challenge. Does that justify intentionally killing an innocent human being? See, the argument only works if you assume the unborn aren't human, but they haven't argued for it. We as Christians who are pro-lifers cannot allow that assumption to go unchallenged. We have to challenge it. And I'm going to answer the question, what is the unborn? I'm not going to assume an answer. I'm going to argue for an answer. What is the unborn? Get ready. I'm not going to scripture. That may surprise some of you. We're going to go to the science of embryology. Here's what that science says in a sentence. 
From the earliest stages of development, from the one cell stage, you were a distinct living and whole human being. I need you to hold your hand out like this and I want you to give yourself a good pinch on the back of your hand. Go ahead, give yourself a good pinch. You can do it, everybody. The pastor's doing it. You can go for this, okay? I, I just got clerical permission right there. Uh, give yourself a good pinch. Congratulations, you just sent a couple of hundred somatic cells hurling to their demise on the table place in front of you. The news gets worse. Each one of those cells individually contains your entire DNA encoding. Did you just commit mass homicide? If you're worried that you did, you did not. And let me tell you why. These cells, though they contain your DNA encoding, are merely part of a larger human entity, you. They are not distinct whole human beings the way you were at the embryonic stage, the way I was at the embryonic stage. <clears throat> There is a difference in kind between each of our bodily cells and the embryonic human beings we once were. Now that's the science of embryology. So why is that so hard for people to grasp? Well, one reason is, as I mentioned a moment ago, they reduce all moral questions to mere preference issues and they get messed up in their thinking. But there's another issue that I think we can all be sympathetic to. Have you ever seen a picture of an embryo that's a day old? You need a microscope, it looks like a ball of 10 cells. And people say that doesn't look like a baby. And they're right, it doesn't look like a baby. But you know what it does look like? Exactly what a human being at that stage of development should look like. And sometimes our intuitions are wrong. And let me give you an illustration that hopefully might help. Um, I want you to imagine that we are leaving this luncheon and we're gonna go to DFW and jump on a charter and we're going to go on a safari deep in the Mexican jungle. And while we're on that safari, you are at the front of the safari, you just happen to get the privileged position, and you had your Polaroid camera with you all lined up ready to go. Now everybody in the room who's under the age of 40, listen to me. There was a time when we did not take pictures with our phones. <laughs> we had devices known as cameras and they were square deals, the lens would open up and light would come in and record images on this stuff called film. Film was expensive. We did not waste it taking pictures of our food. Um, by the way, if you're a dude and you're here and I ever see on your social media a dainty little plate with dainty little portions on it and cute little silverware and pretty flowers, I defriend you. It better be a rack of ribs or an In-N-Out burger, we're done. But the way it would work for all you youngsters, you'd, you'd take the film, you'd shoot 36 exposures, and then you'd gently remove it from your camera, and you'd put it in this little plastic cylinder thing with a lid on it, and then you'd drive to the far corner of the neighborhood supermarket where there was a little yellow and white shack called Photomat. You would drop your pictures off, you'd wait a month and a half to get them back, <laughs> half of them overexposed. That's the way we lived back in the dark ages for all of you that are, have no clue. But the Polaroid camera was the only antidote available to that. And for those of you that have one now, you kind of have an idea of how they work. You shoot your picture and it spits the paper out. You don't have to wait a month and a half. You pull it out, you shake it. Some of you are doing the muscle memory on me right now. You shake it and your picture would gradually emerge right in front of you. To borrow an example from Richard Stith, I want you to imagine you're at the front of that safari and you have your Polaroid camera geared up to go and you just happen to capture a picture of a black jaguar leaping in front of our safari. Mid-air, you got him. Now black jaguars are almost never filmed in the wild. You not only got it in the wild, you got him mid-air and you captured him perfectly and you're breathless with anticipation waiting for that picture to emerge because you know National Geographic will pay you huge bucks for it. But while you're waiting for the picture to appear, I come up behind you, yank your camera out of your hands, and I yank the paper out of it and I tear up your, your photo. Are you angry at me? Yeah, you're very angry. What if I glibly replied, what's the big deal? I didn't see a jaguar there. All I saw was a white paper and a brown smudge. Would that satisfy you? You'd look at me and say, you're out of your mind. The jaguar in the picture was already there. We just couldn't see him yet because he was still developing. Men and women from the one cell stage, you were already there. You were already an image bearer. You were just, we couldn't see you yet because you were still developing. That's the science of embryology. 
There's another question, though, we need to be clear on. The question, what is the unborn, tells us the unborn are distinct living and whole human beings, but it doesn't answer the question of what makes us valuable. In just a moment, I'm going to have you look around the room and stare at some people. Don't do it yet. If there's any single people here and you saw somebody of the opposite sex that might look you know, pretty nice, and you're thinking, I'd like to make eye contact. This will be your God-sanctified moment to do it. <laughs> do not laugh. I met my wife that way. Uh, and uh, this will be your opportunity. If you're married, I trust you know where to look. <laughs> One, two, three, go. Stare around the room at some people. Give them the eye. Give them the good eye. <clears throat> All right, look back this way. What makes us equal. As you were staring around the room at people, what makes us equal? Our culture's obsessed with equality, is it not? We want income equality, we want marriage equality, you can marry your canary if you want to, <laughs> but we want equality. But let me ask this, what makes us equal in the first place? Are we all physically equal in this room today? Not a chance. At age 62, I can still shoot three-point shots, but I'll never make one in a game of basketball. You want to know why? Because although the strength is still there, the speed and agility are gone. And I'm looking at most of the, the people in this room, I'd have trouble beating you one-on-one -on -one because I don't have the physical development I once did. But men and women, if Planned Parenthood is right, that we can dismember a living human fetus because it's not as developed as you and I, if our development is what gives us our dignity and value rather than us being image bearers, if you have more physical development, development than me, you have a greater right to life than me and human equality is out the window. Are we all equally self-aware right now? How many of you had coffee before coming here or coffee while you were here? Coffee is proof that God has not utterly forsaken us. <laughs> that and bacon, right? <clears throat> well... Let me ask this, if you had coffee, either at lunch or before coming here, your synapses right now are firing on all cylinders. You're right here with me. If you didn't have coffee, the carbs from the bread you just ate are settling in, and if you ate a cookie, you're this side of comatose right now. <laughs> but if Peter Singer is right, the ethicist at Princeton University, who argues that no newborn should be considered a person until 30 days after birth and disabled infants can be killed on the spot, if it suits the preferences of the parents, if he's right that self-awareness is what gives us value and the newborn doesn't have it and the fetus doesn't have it, and he's right, neither do have it. He's right about that. His conclusion is if self-awareness is what gives us value, you people at Planned Parenthood are inconsistent. He actually goes after them. He says, you wanna draw this arbitrary line at birth as if that's a meaningful event, what really matters is self-awareness, and newborns don't have it. But if he's right that self-awareness gives you your dignity, if your cognitive processes are what give you value and a right to life, and you have more of them than me, you have a greater right to life than me. Human equality is out the window. There's one thing we share equally as you were staring each other up a few moments ago. I won't ask if anybody saw anybody they want to talk to after this event, but that would be interesting, wouldn't it? Uh, <laughs> The one thing we share equally doesn't come in degrees, and here's what it is. Every one of us in this room right now equally has a human nature that bears the image of God. Now, some of you are going, wait a minute, don't give me these big philosophic words like nature. What do you mean by nature? Let me simplify this for you. All living things have natures that determine the kind of thing they are. For example, if you have a goldfish, it has a goldfish nature. If you have a dog, what kind of nature does it have? Dog nature. If you have a cat, what kind of nature does it have? Evil. Satanic, exactly. Yes, sir. <laughs> Spot on. My cat has shredded two leather jackets of mine. And uh, I almost had to go to pastoral counseling without, or I would have given him up for adoption without consulting the family. But yes, you're a human being. What kind of nature do you have? Human nature. You might say evil too, but human nature. In other words, human parents create human offspring. If anybody ever doubts that you have a human nature or that that embryo has a human nature, here's the question you need to ask them. How is it possible for two human parents to create offspring that isn't human but later becomes so? How is that even possible? 
to cite the eminent world-renowned philosopher Ricky Ricardo, they have some splaining to do at that point. How is that even doable? There are differences between you, the embryo, and you, the adult that's here today, but that's not the issue. The issue is not are there differences. The issue is do those differences matter such that we can say it's okay to kill you then, but not now. If I can preach for a moment, forgive me, Pastor. Christians have a nasty habit of always assuming the burden of proof. We assume that if somebody raise, raises an objection, we have to be the ones to come up with all the explanations. But that's not true. The person making the claim has to do the justifying. If I claim there's a pink elephant swinging from that exit sign back there, the 12 of you that just looked did the right thing, who bears the burden of proof, you or me? I do, because I made the claim. If somebody says that embryo is not even self-aware, how can you claim it's one of us? Or they say it can't feel pain or whatever else they come up with. Who bears the burden of proof, you or them? They bear the burden of proof to explain why those things are decisive in the first place, not you. And there are differences, and let me go over them and you'll see they don't matter. The differences between you, the embryo, and you, the adult that's here today, are size, level of development, environment, and degree of dependency. Stephen Schwartz suggests the acronym SLED to remember these four differences. Size, were you smaller as an embryo? Indeed you were, but why does body size determine value? How does it determine value? You know, if you think about a basketball star playing for the Dallas Mavericks, and if he's a seven foot two player, he's taller than everybody in the room, but is he more human and valuable because of it? No, body size doesn't equal value. What about your level of development? There's your L in that acronym. You were less developed as an embryo. Your level of development was less. So why does that matter? Two-year-old girls are less developed than 24-year-old young women. Two-year-old girls do not have a developed reproductive system yet. Are they less human and valuable than the 24-year-old who does? I speak to high school students all the time. And I was in a large Catholic high school not long ago, and I said to the 800 students up in the bleachers, you are less developed than your parents. You're less developed than your parents physically, and you're less developed than your parents intellectually, which came as a complete shock to every one of them. <laughs> But you don't reach your intellectual peak until your mid-40s. Does it follow your parents have a greater right to life than you simply because they're more developed? By the way, this is precisely the point Abraham Lincoln would make when he would debate proponents of slavery. Lincoln's opponents would say that slave differs from us. And Mr. Lincoln would say, you're right, he does. He is different from us. But is he different from us in ways that justify enslaving him? And I'm going to quote Lincoln word for word because I think it powerfully illustrates the problem that pro-abortionists have. Lincoln said this, Oh, you say man A is white, man B is dark. Oh, it is skin color then, the fair-skinned man having the right to enslave the dark-skinned man. Take care. By that rule, you're a slave to the first person you meet with skin fairer than your own. You say it's not skin color, it's a matter of intelligence. The white man you falsely allege has superior intellect to the dark man, take care yet again. By that rule, you're a slave to the first person you meet with an intellect superior to yours. Do you see what Lincoln's doing here? The very arguments used to justify enslaving that dark man worked equally well to enslave whites. And Peter Singer, who I cited a moment ago, is at least honest enough to say the very same arguments that justify killing fetuses justify killing people outside the womb as well. Be careful what you ask for. Size, level of development, what about environment, where you're located? You were in the womb, now you're out. How does where you are determine what you are? If you drove at least 17 miles to come to lunch here today, can I see your hands? Raise them up high, okay. Council for Life, you have some devoted followers here, this is good. 27 miles, 37 miles, this is starting to get serious. All right, 47 miles, 67 miles. Okay, we've, I've still got competition here. 97 miles. Okay, 807 miles, I win. <laughs> All right. Um, if a journey of 67 miles doesn't change you from one kind of thing to another, how does a journey of seven inches down the birth canal suddenly transform you from non-human, non-valuable thing we can kill to valuable human being that we cannot? And the answer is, if you weren't already human and valuable, you're not gonna get there just changing your address. Finally, degree of dependency. Yeah, you depended on your mother for survival. 
But since when does that matter? Always ask the question, why does this matter? Whatever trait they throw out, tell me why that's decisive. Make them defend their own claim. All right, you depended on your mother for survival. How does dependency on another human being mean we can intentionally kill you? I'm going to get their names wrong, probably. I'm going to do my best here. I think their last name is Henschel. They're known as the Henschel twins. They're now in their early 30s. Maybe you've seen pictures of them in People magazine or elsewhere. If you read People, you need to get saved, but come see me afterward. We'll talk about it. But in the press, you may have seen pictures of these young women. You look at them, they're conjoined twins. There's one set of legs, and then from the waist up, two body trunks, two shoulders, two heads. And they are literally interconnected together. You cannot separate them without killing both of them because they share bodily organs, circulatory system, the whole thing. If it's true, though, that you have no right to life until you can live independent of another human being, neither one of those girls has a right to life, and both can be killed. Size, level of development, environment, degree of dependency, none of those are good reasons for saying we could kill you as an embryo, but not now. So let's talk our last point here. What is our duty? You've heard the case for life. We're distinct living whole human beings, and there's no essential difference between us as embryos and us as adults that would justify killing us back then. So what does that mean? What's our duty in all of this? And I'll give it to you in a sentence. It is to love our unborn neighbor and his mother. I want to switch for a moment and talk about his mother. 40% of all abortions annually are repeat abortions. Do you know why? Because the first abortion never got resolved. And you know why it never got resolved? Because the person never found the solution for post-abortion guilt. There is one hope for sinners who have had abortions, just like there's one hope for all of us as sinners, and that is found in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that gospel, men and women, tells the story of a good God who creates a good world, but we as his creation rebel against our maker through our first parents, Adam and Eve, and God who would have been perfectly just to be done with the entire race at that point and say, I'm done with you, instead has a way, sends Jesus to stand in our place condemned as a substitute for our rebellion against him. And God the Father visits on Jesus the punishment and his judgment for sin that all of us in this room deserve. And the great news of the gospel is three days later, God raises Jesus from the dead as proof that that sacrifice for our sin was sufficient. And that means for post-abortion men and women, some of whom may be here today, that what you need more than anything is not an excuse. You need an exchange. You need Christ's righteousness for your sinfulness. And the good news of the gospel is if you're trusting in Jesus alone for your salvation, God the Father isn't your judge anymore. He's your heavenly father and you get adopted into his family as a dearly loved child. That's the great news of the gospel. We also need to know, though, how to defend our unborn neighbor. And I told you I would show you how to do that in a minute or less. We're going to do that right now. And pastor, in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to time me, okay? All right, so hang on. Don't, don't fall asleep on me here. Stay, stay with me. I don't know how it is in your family, but in our family at the holidays, we have unbelievers around our table. We have neighbors who are not believers, and we have family members who are not believers. And we've had this tradition in our home for a while that if we know a, a family in the neighborhood that is isolated, we just bring them over. We make extra food, and they come over. Or, and we've got extended family who are not Christian and who are not pro-life. Pretend you have an Aunt Betty. Aunt Betty lives in Boston. As a Lakers fan, I can tell you no good thing comes out of Boston. <laughs> you have an Aunt Betty, though. She's from Boston. And she comes to your house at Thanksgiving. She's not Christian. She's not at all pro-life. But she's somewhat taken by you. She's very curious about you. And she's taking her bites of turkey and stuffing. And between bites of turkey and stuffing, she finally drops her fork and says, OK, I just got to ask, why are you pro-life? Here's your answer in a minute or less. Start the clock. Aunt Betty, I'm pro-life because it's wrong to intentionally kill innocent human beings. And the science of embryology is clear that from the earliest stages of development, you were a distinct living and whole human being. You weren't part of another human being like skin cells on the back of my hand. You were already a whole living member of the human family. 
even though you have yet to even though you had yet to grow and develop. And you know what else, Aunt Betty? There's no essential difference between you, the embryo, and you, the adult, that would justify killing you back then. Differences of size, level of development, environment, and degree of dependency are not good reasons for saying we could kill you then, but not now. How'd I do, Pastor? That was about 35 seconds. 35 seconds, okay. I am slow on the basketball court, but that was rocking it. Now, can I ask a question? How many Bible verses did I cite? But did I communicate biblical truth? Yes, I did. And you know what? You can do that too. And some of you, I know, I was watching you. You were taking notes faster than broke people at a Dave Ramsey seminar. And you're thinking, how could I keep up with this guy? That was a bad joke, I know. But um, everybody's laughing. I got away with it. Uh, how many of you would like to have that text to your phone within seven minutes? All right, here's how you do it. On the screen. Oh, oh close. Oh, She's going to put that up on the screen. But if you text LTI, that stands for Life Training Institute, just text LTI to 229-258-6290. We're going to put that up on the screen. <laughs> text LTI to 229-258-6290. In about seven to nine minutes, you're going to have that. Your phone's going to start buzzing, and you're going to have that there for you. And that is a way so that you can have that available to communicate that next time you need to put a pebble in someone's shoe. Uh, another thing about what are you just text LTI, LTI to that number. You don't have to spell out Life Training Institute, just LTI to that number. And uh, we have counselors standing by ready to give you this so that you can get out the door when it gets locked. If you flash this as you leave, you get to go. Uh, one other thing you can do that would be very, very helpful. On your tables, there is a response device that looks like this. This is a way for you to tangibly help pro-life efforts right here in Dallas. The Council for Life is doing work, as you heard, Council for Life is doing work in schools, with pregnancy centers, with women who need assistance and helping the pro-life effort here in this state, but specifically here in Dallas as well. This is a chance for you to help this effort locally. And there's some good news here I want to tell you about. The good news is this. There is a matching grant available today. Anybody who is a new donor who gives for the first time, your gift is going to be matched. Uh, up to $10,000. If you increase your current monthly support, your gift will be matched. Or if you have not given for the last five or six years and you want to re-engage, your gift will be matched at up to $10,000 to help Council for Life do the pro-life work that needs to be done in this community. So would you take this form right now and you can go ahead and fill this out even as we're here. I'm going to fill mine out and... Uh, we're going to start listening for phones to start buzzing. I know everybody's thinking, where's my buzz? You'll get it, I promise. And you won't need to go to the bar to get it. Uh, if you would fill this out, some of you could give a gift today that could really make a difference. For some of you, that gift might be $1,000. It might be $100. I don't know what your level is. But whatever you can do to give a sacrificial gift, would you consider doing that to help Council for Life do the work it needs to do here, supporting pro-life ministry. In fact, I'm just going to take a minute and fill this out. You go ahead and do yours as well. And uh, um, I forgot to ask, is credit card available as an option? So credit cards, all of them? Absolutely. Credit card, cash, online, at Council for Life. Okay. Donate, and then the QR code. And the QR code is there if you want to do it on your phone right there. I'm going to go for my Delta Miles since they lost my luggage today. But yeah, you can go ahead and give and uh, just please write neatly and not like I tend to do. And when you're done, if you would just slip that back into the envelope that's there, that would be helpful and we'll collect those. But let's commit ourselves to go out there and give them heaven, folks. What do you think? Can we do this? Can we be apologists? Can we do this in a minute or less? I think we can. God bless you as you do that. God is not going back to Delta Airlines. 
this afternoon. He is going to El Phoenix. At 6 o'clock, we're going to have another presentation by Scott for what we call our young adults in Dallas. So if you have a young adult, friend, neighbor, co-worker, child, that you want to hear Scott's message, send them to El Phoenix Restaurant downtown to the rooftop area. It's a fun event. We serve a Mexican buffet and there will be beverages and so and there will be Scott. And that's the most important thing and I'd love to get my slide to work. There it is. Okay, you are invited with young adults this evening. Thank you for coming. We so appreciate every one of you. There are many of our beneficiaries here in the audience today. If you want to learn more about a pregnancy center or a maternity home, foster and adoption care, youth mentoring and education in the schools, they are here. So say hello. Thank you for coming.